Welcome to our voices. Again, I have a special guest with me. This is in honor of Jazz Appreciation Month. I have the famous, the infamous saxophonist, <laughs> Marion Meadows. Marion, how you doing, infamous. man? <laughs> I'm doing good, Ray. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing fine. Hey, man, again, I want to take time and say thank you. It's an honor to have this interview with you. Again, we're going to talk about a few things. And uh, like I said, man, I'm, I'm ready to go. You ready? <laughs> well, thanks for having me. You know, I'm all the way over here in Hawaii, so we have a a, a, a big time difference. But, uh, you know, uh, it's it's uh, nice to finally get a chance to uh, get together and sit down and chat a little bit. So I was looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's start with the questions, OK? <laughs> and, you know, I am from West Virginia, so. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. And be now, before I start, <laughs> tell the viewers and listeners something about Marion Meadows. Well, I was born in uh, Mullins, uh, West Virginia. Uh, my father was, uh, like many fathers, the coal miner, and he was a World War II veteran, uh, along with my uncles. And um, he worked the mine in uh, near Mullins called the Wyco Mine. And at that time, uh, it was still, believe it or not, they still had the black camp and the white camp. It was still segregated when I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, I left when I was a little kid. Uh, but my father, uh, you know, he, he got a chance to go to school and then moved to um, move the family up to New York, eventually to Connecticut. And we I, I was raised in Connecticut, but all my relatives, well, not all my relatives, but many of my relatives were still in West Virginia and my grandparents. So I would travel back in the summers and uh, on vacations to visit. But I do remember quite a bit of uh, West Virginia from when I was up to age of five. You know, I kind of remember a lot. My mother said I had a, an amazing memory for, for a child, for a baby. Uh, but I had very fond memories of West Virginia. And, uh, you know, it was one of those towns where you, the, the teachers, you know, back in, the, in those days, the teachers were like your surrogate moms, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I have a, I have a, you know, a love in my heart. My parents retired back to West Virginia, still had land there and moved back to Beckley. And my mother was from Raleigh County, so she was from Beckley area. So, you know, uh, I've spent a lot of time and still do, um, except my mom perhaps passed away a couple of years ago. So, but I still have cousins and, and relatives still in West Virginia. So, uh, but it's, uh, you know, when I got to Connecticut, uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I was kind of uh, headed towards the music at an early age in elementary school. And before I knew it, uh, just after about three years of being uh, in school in Connecticut, my first elementary years of elementary school, I started playing clarinet. And I was a clarinet player in the band. Uh, I wanted to play the saxophone. Band teacher said there were no more saxophones. He, and I said, what you got? And he goes, clarinet. <laughs> and I said, man, I can't, I can't play clarinet. I'm gonna beat up if I carry that little thing home from school. You gotta give me something bigger than that. <laughs> I said, I'm not even that big myself. I, I got to carry a little case and a little me. Give me right. something bigger. But anyway, right. so I was uh, trained on clarinet um, mm -hmm. until I got to high school, believe it or not. I didn't even get a saxophone until I got to high school. But the band teacher wanted me to play in the concert band and the jazz band. Um, my mom bought me a tenor sax. And uh, but I, I was still, you know, I still had that love for that clarinet sound. Uh, I, I, I guess more than that, I had the, the discipline and the embouchure. The clarinet is a very difficult instrument. Saxophone is, tends to be a little bit easier fit, you know, as far as learning curve. Uh, soprano, not so much, but it uh, depends on who the musician is. But for me, the, the transition to saxophone was not very hard to do. And uh, as, I, as I moved, Move towards the saxophone, and that's why people know me as more of a soprano player because that seems to be the voice that I identify with. Uh, so you know, uh, that was the that was my foray into my early years as a as a musician, and then later on, I went to study at Berklee School of Music, uh, State University of New York, and um, so and as of recently, until two thousand, I think as of two thousand sixteen, I now have my doctorate. And, uh, you know, so you can call me Dr. Meadows. 
<laughs> okay, Doc. Okay, uh, that's they've been asking question. me to teach, but I love I love to teach jazz history. So anyway, okay. but yeah, I've had a wonderful uh, experience music wise. I've had a great career. I can't stop learning, and that's why I always tell the young students, you can't ever learn everything there is to learn about uh, music and art and culture. So um, I continue to be a student of this and uh, and also a teacher. So here I am today, 16 albums later, and I've recorded, recorded with so many people. I, I kind of started my career with Norman Connors back in the day after college. I got a job playing with Norman Connors in his band, uh, wrote some songs for him. I actually had a day job at the time and um, eventually quit my day job and that was it. Jumped both feet in and uh, I was a professional musician. I haven't looked back since and it's been a been a great experience. You've answered at least three of my questions already. <laughs> okay. Doc, yeah. you, you did, okay? It's, it's all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> how did you start your career and was it rough or smooth? Well, you know, uh, I kind of came up at the time, you know, with the musicians who were coming up in the 80s and 90s were they had we had gigs, you know, we had clubs to play in. So we, you know, I, it's not so much anymore. Uh, and we had we had clubs that we played in that paid us really well. So coming out of college, um, I had a lot of gigs, had a lot of bands that I played in. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to get that's that's really your graduate school as a musician. It's when you, especially I lived right outside of New York City. So a lot of the stuff I did was in New York City. And they hurt your feelings. <laughs> you know, you yeah. you show up in New York with the wrong attitude and not being able to play the song, they tell you to go home. You know, they don't they don't have time. They said we got the best in New York already. We don't need we don't need you coming down here half stepping. And you're from Connecticut too, you know. So <laughs> yeah. But uh it was great uh, being able to be around all those incredible musicians in New York City. You know, Connecticut, we had great musicians. Um, and the, the guys I grew up with all went on to become great musicians. So it was not really, for me, uh, a bumpy road. It was a, a, a very smooth transition. And uh, there was a, there's, there's a great chronology to what happened in my life, in my career, as, it, as we all progressed. My friend Brian Keene has now won many, many Emmy Awards as a writer and producer. Uh, and, you know, my friend Joy Milano went on to be the musical director for Barry Manilow for many years. This was my little band that I started in Connecticut. Okay. Uh, and we all we all were very successful as we moved into our careers. So things did kind of happen. So it wasn't really, uh, I mean, of course, you know, I mean, you're a musician, so it's not going to be, it, it wasn't all, you know, it wasn't always smooth. Uh, but we, we, we were all in all the way. I mean, it wasn't like we decided that we were going to do something else. You know, we decided to commit to being professional musicians and we had prepared ourselves. So it worked out pretty good. Doc, you <laughs> mentioned Norman Connors and your bio, you have done collaborations with many people and one person stuck out the most. And I have to ask this question. And this wasn't one of the questions that was I, I gave to you. One <laughs> singer that you did some work with was Angela Bofield. Oh, Angela Bofield. Please. She's my I heart. Mean, she, I mean, Angela Bofield. She's one of my favorites. Oh, she and she's one of my favorites as well. I mean, she is really a consummate professional. And, you know, and I say that because I had a chance to work with her for many years. Uh, Angie Bofield would come on the stage and, you know, a lot of singers, you know, I mean, and rightfully so, they're singing, they want to get the monitors right. She'd come on stage, very seldom would she even mention that there was anything wrong with her monitor, you know. She was such a gracious professional, but she was, when they say angel of the night, she really was. I mean, she, what a pristine voice, and, and she's a big, tall woman. I mean, she was, you know, she's stately woman. Yes, uh, she is. Beautiful her voice, her whole, her whole demeanor. Uh, what a pleasure. And I'm so blessed to have been able to work with, with Angie Bofield. And I, re and I remember Angie Bofield, I hadn't even met her because she was recording on GRP over when Tom Brown was over there and Dave Grusin, 
you know, he owned the label. Yeah. And so he was pretty much grooming. Um, and, you know, those artists, you know, Dave Grusin was grooming Angie Bofield, Tom Brown. You know, I mean, you had Marcus Miller, all those guys were over there. Um, and, um, you know, they were singing. Dave Valentine was on GRP. And they were doing, you know, real, really hip contemporary music way back when, back yeah. in the 80s. You know, I mean, it just goes to show you how, I don't want to say it's more sophisticated back then, but they just seemed to push the edge a lot more in those days. It wasn't really, it wasn't really gearing up for any particular kind of radio, except the radio was really contemporary at the time. And you remember David Sanborn, John Clemmer, Norman Connors, of course, mm -hmm. uh, Lonnie Liston Smith, they all came from that era. Of course, D uh, Dave Grusin, uh, and again, Tom Brown broke out with Funkin' for Jamaica, and he just went in a whole nother jazzy R&B direction. Uh, of course, Angela Bofill had all those great hits. And of course, people make the go go world go around. Her version of that was Breakout, and it was a super, super hit for her. Uh, so yeah, Angie Bofill, when you mention, I I'll light up every time I hear her name. And she's just <laughs> such, she's such an incredible person. Yeah, oh, beautiful voice. Uh, Doc. <laughs> how, how does a jazz, I mean, how does a sax player have their own signature style of play? You know, people have asked me that many times. Uh, I I think it's the voice that you're, it's the voice that you are born with. That's the God-given talent that you do have. And it's up to you. And I'll This is what I always and about, you know, what are the secrets to success or your sound? Uh, well, first of all, that's what you're born with. You're born with that talent to be able to express yourself in that way. Everyone, if if we if if everybody picked up a saxophone, we're all going to sound different on it. Some people might sound like they're playing like another artist because it's their favorite artist, so they'll play their licks so they can sound like they're playing. But the sound that you emit from the horn is is actually uh, being uh, created by your the velocity of your wind and your your inner voice comes through on a saxophone and any any horn for that matter. Um, but Grover Washington once saw me when I was in college at Berkeley, sitting in with Bobby Humphrey, and um, I, if I had known Grover Washington was in the audience, I would have I would have ran out the back door, you know, <laughs> because yeah. I was just a college kid and I'm certain I idolized. Grover Washington, uh, but he was in the audience. He was coming to town for a show that he was going to start the following day and happened to catch the set that I uh, Bobby Humphrey. But then he approached me after and and and, and told me, uh, you know, let's get together. He, he said that he enjoyed my playing. And uh, he wanted to, you know, I got together with Grover for lunch. I thought I was going for a lesson. I brought my horn. He said, man, I ain't giving you no lesson. <laughs> <laughs> they said we, we're just gonna talk you don't need a lesson right. but anyway he gave me some really sound advice uh he said that i already had a sound and that i should stick with that and i played a lot of grover licks back then he goes you don't need to play any of my licks anymore just follow your follow your heart do what you do he says stay in your lane create your own existence your own journey with your you already have a sound he told me you have a, a, a beautiful sound and uh, and I did. I took his advice, and I just started to stay on that path of creativity, and not do too many cover songs. You know, you get in the habit of doing cover songs as an instrumentalist, and so you'll tend to start to sound like maybe something that you're not you're not giving yourself a chance to be the voice that you should be by doing you know expressing yourself more in your original music. So that's I've done. I've chosen to not do. I do some covers, but not many over the years. And um, I've been able to carve out uh, my own voice and people say they recognize it when they hear it. I mean, of course, I'm playing. I'm one of the only guys that really play mostly soprano sax. But right. But uh, but even then, uh, a lot of people say when we hear your soprano, we know it's Marion Meadows. And, and I think that's a wonderful compliment, because like I said, I took Grover's advice 
And that would somebody that would be someone's advice that you would want to take. <laughs> Grover Washington. Yeah, you know, you know Grover when you hear when you hear Grover, you know that's Grover Washington. So in, in <laughs> the first 10 seconds, I can tell if it's Grover Washington. Uh yeah. I can tell Joe if it's Albright. Najee, <laughs> Joe yeah. Albright, uh right. Boney James. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, and and I tell you what, man, because your music, I mean, it is, I mean, really, I love it. Cause because see, my my top three songs, Suede. Turn up the quiet, okay. and one more chance. Okay. And I had to throw yeah. a, a little collaboration, something with some voice in there. I mean, it was, and it's smooth, okay. man. It, it's smooth. Wait, I got something for you. Hold on, I got something for you. Okay. You cut out the part of me running, but right here. here okay. <laughs> Like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving a little little something something there. I like that. I like that. D Dr. Marion, name a jazz artist today who pushed you to bring your A-game. Well, there have been many. I mean, I, I had a chance to do some studying with Eddie Daniels, an amazing uh, saxophonist and clarinetist who played on Angie Bofield's I Try. He's the tenor sax player on that when he's really mostly known as a clarinetist, believe it or not. Um, but um, there have been many, many artists. Um, you know, I grew up with a lot of great guys that were uh, we all kind of pushed each other. But one of one, you know, living friend right now who really pushes me and encourages me is uh, Kirk Whalen. You know, he is always on my case and we, we just always, <laughs> you know what I mean? We just. Yeah. You know, he just calls me up. What you doing? You know, and 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 that's just the whole. You know, it's a metaphor for everything in our lives because we've kind of been connected that way. And um, I did my jazz series with um, my vintage jazz series. He was my very first guest on, and we talked about Sidney Bechet. And you know, this is what I, I this is what I mean by you just can't ever get enough information. We we have so much rich culture in this in our country. And to have the great, great mentors that I've had, you know, uh, Joe Henderson and uh, Sonny Fortune, these are these are guys that have, you know, I, I mean, I I including um, uh, you know, have been friends ever since we were both really young and came out with our first records. So, you know, Najee used to come up to Connecticut from, from the Queens uh, and he would uh, scout out my musicians from my band. He stole my guitar player. <laughs> Did he give you money for it? Did he give you a little payback or something? <laughs> but he played on my record last year, so. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we, we we have been such dear friends for so many years and have been um, in awe of one another. I mean, it, he's just an amazing musician and his compliment, uh, accomplishments are, 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 are so many. Um, I'm just blessed to be in this community because it's such a, a, it's such a giving community. Not only are we inspiring one another, but you know, no one, there's no, there's no agenda in the arts community. You, you can be me, fe, male, female, black, white, Chinese, doesn't matter. We don't care. Yeah. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't, we, there's no discrimination. We don't, 
it doesn't happen because it's all about the love of what we do. It's this, when you walk in the door with this, you could be anything you want to be. And nobody will look at you like you're anything other than the sax player. You see what I'm right. saying? Right. As long as it sounds good, right? It's like, that's the sax player. It's not yeah. or the or the black sax player or the white sax player. Mm -hmm. It's the sax player in the band. Yes. That's why you, if you go, if you said to somebody, uh, I saw a Dave Matthews band, they would mm -hmm. say, oh, yeah, I love that violinist in the band. But they don't say the black violinist with dreadlocks. They just say the violinist. Right. You know, you know, two two bands in particular, jazz, uh, Hiroshima and the Chick Corea band. Yeah. Prime right. example, you know, and yeah. no, no one, no one gets into that, you know, that, that, um, oh, look at them. And like you say, you know, the, 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 the race playing, you know, no, they, they play the music. It's never been a part of my existence as a as an artist, so therefore, I that's why I don't really have a whole lot of tolerance of what happens in society, because it's so incredibly ignorant. Yeah. Because you never ever look at it that way when you're looking at artists. You always look at them in admiration of their artistry, and so therefore, you, you we as artists have never walked in a door and said, "Oh, wow, wow that's uh, that's that's like a." It's like a white guy. I don't, I don't think I want to play with him. No one's ever said that. <laughs> you know? That is matter, crazy. matter of fact, it's like, can you play? We want you in the band. We'll go find you. We don't we don't care where you live. Right. You know, and that's what I'm saying. Rich, poor, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's just that when the meetings, when the when the meetings of the minds and the music, the necessity of 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 speaking the language and telling the story. The characters in the in the play do not matter what they look like at all, yep. you know. So, because I have an interesting uh, I have an interesting quote from my and if you go to oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I have an interesting quote. I I have an interesting quote. If you go to my jazz series, um, it's a vintage jazz series, and I think it's episode three. Uh, I talk about the uh, the ladies of swing from back in the 1940s when the men were all off at war. A lot of the big bands were all female, and um, and so one of the women said that you know when you know when the men came back from the war, a lot of us got squeezed out, and then of course they they had to do they had a mixed band. The international ladies of swing um, had a mixed band. They had they had they had black girls, white you know uh, Asian in the band so a lot of places they went in the south doing jim crow they couldn't stay at certain hotels they couldn't play at certain theaters and she says but you know what <laughs> you put us behind a curtain you don't know what we are you don't even know if we're men or not she yeah. goes you you put us behind a curtain we could play like the men and so when you open up the curtain then only then can you decide to be prejudiced against us because you couldn't do that if the curtain was closed <laughs> that, that you don't even know if we're women or not, she said. So never mind if we were a mixed band. Yeah. But the, when the curtain is closed, you you can, you don't have the opportunity to be a bigot. Yeah. Because you don't know what we are behind the curtain. And, right. you, and you probably dig in the music until we open the curtain. Then all of a sudden, you have a problem. I don't have a problem. The music doesn't have a problem. All of a sudden, now you have, you have instituted, you have infiltrated your own being with some hate for no reason at all. <laughs> Doc, singers first start out writing lyrics for a song. What's your approach to creating a song? It varies for me. I'm not a typical sit around, write a song kind of person. Uh, I, I, I tend to write in waves and in stages. And so I don't, I'm, really eclectic in my choice and music and styles and what I like to record. So it gets me in trouble sometimes because sometimes it wants something that is maybe smooth jazz or whatever, but I, I don't think like that. I, I just, I tell stories kind of like what Grover would say, you know, when you, when you, uh, when you do a solo, you have to tell a story. You have to start out at a, at a place and end at a place. It's not all here, you know, it, it builds. And so writing is that way for me. I, I tend to, um, reflect on the things that I'm feeling at the time, 
uh, my musicianship, what I'm, what I, what I want to execute. And at the same time, maybe something so simple, but it has to have the right tone, the right mood and the right moment. So I don't really have any particular set formula for that. And, um, so therefore, you know, that, that question is wide open because I don't want it when I, when I feel it. So that's why record companies get mad at me because they go, where's the record? <laughs> Okay. I go, you gonna get it? They go, when? <laughs> I said, it's coming. <laughs> they said, when? <laughs> yeah. Doc, which is more complicated when creating a song, creating an instrumental song or a collaboration with a singer? Which one's more, I don't get think a little more work into it? think there's any ability of it and the uh you know whatever the composition is there might be a degree of difficulty and so therefore that's why i tell young musicians you have to be prepared you have to learn how to read music and then even once you learn how to read music you got to continue to improve on your sight reading which you read as soon as it's in front of you because you know along the way you learn how to read music and then you learn how to really read it as soon as it's put in front it's just a mathematical equation so music is mathematical you're dissecting notes. And so therefore, uh, and interpreting the notes as well. So with, when you, once you take the degree of difficulty out of the picture, uh, then it's, it's just what we do. I mean, it's what you're supposed to do as a professional musician. But if you're at the point in your life where that you're professional, but you're also, you have something special to bring to the table, um, then that's you know that's what makes us that's what makes a certain musician a very special musician when they bring something to the table to the party to the song uh, it's their signature it's what the, it's what it's why they are who they are and so that's what makes making music and collaborating so special and especially with vocalists uh, and instrumentalists and of which some vocalists do play instruments so they have a different interpretation of music because they already play something, maybe piano or, or horn or something. Uh, I find that very intriguing and very rewarding, collaborating especially, and still going in the studio and playing live. A lot of musicians do it at home and then they email the tracks around. And But there's still nothing like the playing live in the studio amongst one another and you know that old live playing in a small club as opposed to a big theater. Yeah. You know, that never, ever gets tired. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure most musicians will would agree with that. You mentioned earlier uh, a certain name, a certain gentleman by the name of uh, Bob Thompson. I have a couple of questions and I'll let you go. You mentioned Bob Thompson. Yeah, Bob Thompson. Yeah. Tell me a little something about Bob Thompson. Well, Bob Thompson, I used to come down to Charleston when I would visit my mom on those Tuesday night jam sessions in Charleston and sit in and play uh but i i had known bob for many years bob read the show just before the pandemic up in philadelphia he was in philadelphia for for an event uh he came by and blessed me with his and got up and played with us as a matter of fact uh bob thompson is a living legend especially in in west virginia and i i, I have been I have been nominated for the West Virginia Hall of Fame. They're waiting for me to send in all my stuff. I know he was inducted in the last few years, yeah. and rightfully so, because he is a uh, living legend uh, for West Virginia. But, but Bob is known worldwide. Um, he just chooses to be the guy in, in West Virginia. But um, certainly one of the greatest piano players I've had the pleasure to work with. And again, you know, when you think of a Bob Thompson, look what he brings to the party. He brings that thing that he does, so unique, you know. And he and he can draw on all of his roots, as you know, from straight ahead to gospel to all of those things come out in Bob's music, um, which is why people immediately res resonate with Bob. You know, he has a little bit of something that everyone can feel because you know he's got that old school thing. But you know, he can he can play with the best man. He's He's a tough dude. <laughs> you know, when, when it comes to concerts right here, when, when you hear the word Bob, they know it's Bob Thompson. Yeah. They know it's Bob Thompson. Yeah. yeah. Doc, last question. 
get ready for this right here, okay? You ready? Uh-oh. <laughs> Who is on your Mount Rushmore? Who is on your Mount Rushmore as far as saxophone players? Okay, uh, certainly Kirk Whalen. Um, and, uh, you know, if, I, if it were going to be, uh, you know, posthumous players, and I'm, it would be a different set of guys. And then I have the guys who are around now. But uh, certainly John Coltrane. Um, and, uh, you know, I, there's so many. It would be more than five. <laughs> okay. How many, four? How many? Are there four or five? I forget. Okay, okay. I'll tell you what, I'll give you six. Dudes. I'll give you six. You'll give Go me ahead. six? Okay. I'll give you six. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Um, Charlie Parker. You know, John Coltrane, you know, the guys who, you know, set the set the uh, set the uh, the bar so high for for bebop and and and, and cool jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for a contemporary, the guy who has been the ambassador is Kirk Whalen. Okay. And then the other ambassador in our time would be uh, Gerald Albright. But I would also put Cannibal Adley. So that would be the that would be six. Right. Because. I get one more. Oh, yeah, that would be and then it would be a toss up between like Sonny Stitt and Sonny Rollins. And, you know, you got Gene Ammons, you got George Coleman, you know, I got so many cats. Stanley Turrentine would be my guy because I came up playing tenor style like Stanley Turrentine. So it would be, but there's so many yeah. great guys. But Stanley Turrentine was the voice that I adopted as a tenor player. So I have to put Stanley up there, you know. So that you can play all three saxophones, right? Tenor, alto, and soprano, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really an alto player. I played alto. I used to play alto in the fantasy band with Dave Samuels and uh, John Lee. Uh, that band also had Chuck Loeb, Dave Valentin. And in that band, they had me playing alto. I played alto with the Temptations in Japan uh, for a tour also. I played lead alto. But my voice is really soprano, tenor, the B-flats. And I'm a... I like bass clarinet and clarinet, but um, but mainly the soprano tenor. That's that's my that's my uh, safe zone. <laughs> safe. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> well, Doc, Doctor Meadows. Again, it's an honor, pleasure of interviewing you. And again, uh, your album is coming out twice as nice. Yes, right. Sir. All yes, right. Sir. Um, uh, again, next, uh, next week, the 23rd, 23rd. Okay. And, and you yeah. can pre-order it on iTunes, right? You can go to my website, marionmills.com, get the autograph copy. That's the only place you can get an autograph copy. And I do right. sign them and we have, uh, digital downloads right now. Tonight, you can order the record right now. If you, if you're not, you know, some of us old people still like CDs, uh, because, <laughs> you know, we still like that. You know, the young kids go, what's a CD? They don't even know what it is anymore. Right. Like, why, do why do y'all buy those things? So anyway, but we like something physical in our hands. And and even though we do download a lot of music. But yeah, if you prefer to download it for your car and uh, in, into your uh, music player, uh, iTunes or something. But you can go to marymills.com tonight and get it now. It's available. So All right. Once again. So you get a week ahead of time. <laughs> once again, Mary Meadows, uh, thank you very much for this interview. Ray, my pleasure. Uh, you take care. You be safe, okay? I will. All Thank right, you. All right. Yes, sir.